Hello everyone, this is Dr. Lennon, and today we're going to look at graphs of polynomial functions. We'll start by looking at graphs of quadratic functions. Uh, so remember a quadratic function is just a degree 2 polynomial. So uh, let's say given f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So the following is known as the vertex formula. And it's really all you need to know to be able to graph a quadratic. So it tells you the vertex occurs at x equals negative b divided by 2a. So that gives you the x coordinate of the vertex and then once you know that you can plug it in to find the y coordinate <clears throat> and um, that'll allow you to graph the quadratic very quickly. Um, so uh, one thing to note, so note that this represents Uh, the uh, place where the function attains either a maximum or minimum value. And that is just based on whether the parabola opens upward or downward. So uh, if it opens up, it's going to be a minimum value. So if you had some quadratic that would open upward, the vertex is the very bottom point right here, which in this case would be a minimum. Um, or in the case of a parabola that's opening downward, You'd have the point up here, which would be representative of a maximum value. And that's really it. So graphing quadratics is very, very easy. You just need to keep this formula in mind. So um, let's go ahead and look at a few examples. So example, let's say identify the uh, vertex intercepts and sketch a graph of each function. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's say our first function is f of x just equals x squared minus 2x plus 3. So the first thing here is, well, let's identify that vertex. So in this case, a is the number in front of x squared, which is 1, and b is the number in front of x, which is negative 2. So our vertex is going to be negative b, which is already negative 2, divided by 2 times a, which is 1. So our vertex just comes out to be 1. Um, that's technically the x-coordinate of the vertex. So why don't I label it as such? Let's just say this is the x-coordinate. So then the y-coordinate, we plug that into our function. So this is f of 1, which is 1 squared minus 2 times 1 plus 3. So that comes out to 2. So the vertex is 1, 2. And then we also want to label the intercepts. Um, so we find the um, <clears throat> x-intercepts by setting f of x equal to 0. So let's go ahead and do the x-intercepts. We would get uh, 0 
b equals x squared minus 2x plus 3. So this should factor into x minus, oh, so, so actually this one doesn't factor. It looks like um, we're going to have to use the quadratic formula here. Um, so if we try the quadratic formula, we would get x equals negative b, which is 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is negative 2 squared, minus 4 times 1 times 3 over 2 times 1. And we end up with x equals 2 plus or minus the square root of um, negative 8 over 2. So this is uh, not no real numbers, no real solutions. So for us, that means there are no x-intercepts. So no x-intercepts here. And then lastly, we can look at the y-intercept. The y-intercept is very easy. Just let your x values be 0. So we have our y-intercept. So um, we have the y-intercept is just f of 0, which is 0 squared minus 2 times 0 plus 3, which equals 3. So our y-intercept is 0 comma 3. So uh, now we can actually go ahead and graph this thing. Uh, so the graph would look like, well, um, we have our y-intercept that we just found. which is at 0, 3. And then we have our intercept, which I believe is at 1, 2. Uh, so 1, 2. So this is our intercept. So one thing to know about these quadratic functions is they are symmetric about the vertical line that goes through the intercept. So that means if 1 to the left, you're above 1. If you move 1 to the right, you'll also be above one. So it will look exactly the same to the left of the dotted line as it does to the right of the dotted line. And this will be roughly the picture of our parabola. Generally, you just need to graph three points to find the picture. And um, in general, once you find a second point, you can use symmetry to find a third. So there's our intercept and our, ver uh, our vertex and our intercepts. And then from there, we uh, have sketched the graph. Again, <clears throat> graphing by hand is not the you know, you're not always going to be the most accurate, but you're just looking for a quick sketch. If you want to do it accurately, you may want to use some type of uh, computer program. Okay, so let's try another one. Let's say this time we're trying to graph g of x equals x squared minus 6x. So again, we can start by looking for the vertex. So the x coordinate of our vertex here <clears throat> is going to be negative b, which is the opposite of negative 6 divided by 2 times 1. So this comes out to 3. And then the y-coordinate comes out to, um, you have to plug 3 in. So we're going to be doing g of 3, which is 3 squared minus 6 times 3. So that comes out to negative 9. So our vertex here is the point 3 comma negative 9. And to figure out the intercepts, <clears throat> again, uh, for the x-intercepts, we need to set um, g of x equal to 0. So in this case, we go 0 equals x squared minus 6x. And then this one does in fact factor, which makes things a bit easier. So we get 0 equals x times x minus 6. So x equals 0 or x equals 6. So those are our two x-intercepts. Um, and then our y-intercept. So technically we can, uh, why don't I do the both coordinates of each. Um, so the x-intercepts are going to be 0 comma 0. Um, and 6 comma 0. And then our y-intercepts, well, technically we can only have one y-intercept because these are functions, meaning that they have to pass the vertical line test. So that would be g of 0, 
which is zero squared minus six times zero. And again, so since we knew an x-intercept was zero, zero, we also probably could have guessed that that's the only y-intercept as well. But I just wanted to go through the process so it looked the same as before. Okay, so let's see. We've got our parabola that we want to draw. So we know it hits zero, zero, and then also six, zero. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's our other point, and then we need to go to three and then down nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So all the way down here. And this is roughly the shape of our parabola through those three points. Again, my drawing is not great. And it should look perfectly symmetrical through this dotted line, which I'm sure it does not. But again, graphing by hand, it would uh, graphing on a computer program would make it look a little bit better. Again, that's it. Um, <clears throat> if you uh, want to graph these things, uh, we can also talk about the vertex form briefly. Again, it's not so important once you know the vertex formula, but if you're ever asked about it, maybe we should talk about it. So vertex form of a quadratic. function. Sorry, didn't mean to put that S there. So um, a quadratic function uh, sorry, I'm underlining the wrong thing too. Is said to be in vertex form if it is written uh, f of x equals a times x minus h quantity squared plus k where h comma k is the vertex. Now you can get to this via completing the square, which we've looked at uh, when we were moving towards finding the quadratic formula. But since we know the um, vertex formula, we can also use that to get there as well. Um, so uh, that's that's not too difficult. So let's just do an, an example or two where we put things in uh, vertex form. So uh, example. Let's say write each quadratic in vertex form. So A, let's say we have um, f of x equals 2x squared plus 4x plus 3. Um, so what we want to do is we want to find the uh, x-coordinate and y-coordinate of the vertex, and then that pretty much does everything for us. So the x-coordinate should be negative 4 divided by 2 times 2. Again, b is 4 here in front of the x, and a is 2 in front of the x-squared. So this comes out to negative 1. And then we plug negative 1 into f of x there to find the y-coordinate. So our y coordinate is uh, f of minus one, which is two times minus one squared plus four times minus one plus three, which comes out to positive one. So our vertex is <clears throat> negative one comma one. So that allows us to put it in vertex form very quickly. Um, we just need to uh, plug those things into the formula above. So how do we do that? Well, uh, f of x is going to be um, the number in front, this two in front of the x squared. So we get two 
times x, and then it would be minus negative one quantity squared plus one, which comes out to two times x plus one squared plus one. So that would be the vertex form, and you can multiply it out to check that it's equivalent to the value above. And we can do one more of these, but really that's that's pretty much it. The vertex form is not technically needed once you know the vertex formula, uh, as I've mentioned. So um, why don't we go ahead and do, um, oh, we can even do one that involves maybe fractions or decimals. Let's say g of x equals uh, 3x squared plus 2x minus 2. So again, here we want to find the x-coordinate, which is negative 2. b is 2 here, and a is 3, so 2 times 3. So this comes out to negative 1 third. And the y-coordinate is going to come out to, uh, well, we need to plug that 1 third in. So g of 1 third, which is 3 times 1 third squared plus 2 times 1 third minus 2. So this comes out to 1 third plus 2 thirds minus 2, um, which is just negative 1 in this case. <clears throat> so our vertex here is um, negative one third, comma minus one. So we can go through the same bit that we had for the previous problem, and we know that g of x here is going to be now a three in front times x minus negative one third squared minus one. So we have our vertex form of three times x plus one third squared minus one. And that is the vertex form for that problem. So that's pretty much it for understanding graphs of quadratic functions. So now what we wanna move on to is the graph of general polynomial functions. So um, quadratic ones are kind of the special ones that we've studied because they're such a basic case, but in general polynomials um, are, are, are arbitrarily large, so uh, we're not gonna be able to graph them in quite as much detail, uh, but we can get a general understanding of what they look like. So uh, let's go through that. So graphs of general polynomial functions. So um, let's again just recall what a polynomial function is. So a polynomial function of degree n. So the degree is just the largest power of the variable x that appears. So it is a function of the form Let's say p of x is equal to a sub n times x to the n plus a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus a bunch of other terms, um, plus a sub 1, x plus a sub 0. So a general polynomial um, has a finite number of terms, but it could be very large. It might have 100 terms, whereas our quadratic functions only had three terms. So they're very simple by comparison. So again, where n has to be a non-negative number. Non-negative integer, in fact, it has to be a, a positive whole number or zero. And uh, that leading coefficient a sub n is not allowed to be zero. So, um, the things in front, a sub n, a sub n minus one, all the way down to a sub zero are coefficients. 
These are the coefficients of the polynomial. Um, two of them have special names. Um, so a sub n is known as the leading coefficient. And a sub zero is the constant term. Again, all of this is just kind of mathematical jargon that's used. It's not really gonna help you understand how they are graphed. It just kind of organizes the information into terminology. Um, so understanding polynomial graphs is based on two things, understanding their end behavior and then understanding their intermediate behavior. So the end behavior is completely controlled by that leading term, a sub n, times x to the n. So let's start there. Let's understand the end behavior. And the end behavior will break down into uh, four cases. Sorry, I've got a uh, thing here. Okay, so the end behavior So the end behavior of a polynomial, which basically tells you which way the arrows go. Do they end up going up or down? It is completely determined by the leading term uh, a sub n x to the end. And the two things we care about, we have two questions that we need to answer. Is a sub n a positive or negative number? And the second question is, is n an even or odd number? Once you have those two questions answered, the n behavior is going to break down into one of four cases. So there are then four cases. So case one, you have positive, and even. Case two, you have positive and odd. So in positive and even, it's gonna, it might have a bunch of other bumps and whatever, but eventually both sides go up. So that's positive and even. Positive and odd, we end up with something that looks like this. So the left falls and right rises. So those are the two positive cases. Um, now the other two pictures, Three, we could have negative and even. Or we could have negative and odd. So if we have negative and even, what's gonna happen is both sides are going to go down. So we can kind of split these. Maybe I should split the picture just so we understand what's going on here. Oops, went down a little too far. So this one is both sides go down. <clears throat> 
And then for negative and odd, we end up with the left side rising and the right side falling. So this is left rises and the right side falls. So that's the end behavior. Um, so let's go ahead and we're not going to draw the complete graphs yet. We're just going to determine the end behavior um, because we need to really understand intermediate behavior before we start graphing everything. So let's talk about um, some end behavior. So example, let's just say identify the end behavior of each polynomial function. So a, um, let's say we have um, f of x equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x minus 32. So that's all we care about when we're talking about the end behavior is this first term right here. So um, the leading coefficient is 2, which is positive. So question 1, 2 is greater than 0, positive. So that's the number in front. And then the exponent, 3, is odd. So what was positive and odd? Positive and odd was the left side falls and the right rises. So we know in some sense that our polynomial is going to you know, do this. But we don't know what's kind of happening in the middle. Um, that's what the intermediate behavior is going to determine. It's going to tell us, okay, where are the x-intercepts and what does it do at those x-intercepts? So for now, we're kind of leaving that alone. We're only really caring about this part right here, the left falling and the right rising. So um, I'm going to go ahead and erase that graph because it's not accurate. And if you're just reading the notes, it might confuse you. Okay. So let's go ahead and continue. Let's look at B. Let's say we have, um, let's say G of X equals um, X to the eighth minus three X to the fourth plus X. So again, the leading coefficient is the number in front of the highest power of X. So in this case, it's just one. So one is greater than zero, so that's a positive number. And then the highest exponent, the degree of the function is eight, which is even. So positive and even, both sides rise. So that is the end behavior for this function right here, function b, or function g of x. Um, let's go ahead and look at, let's say maybe um, C, uh, let's say H of X equals um, minus X plus two squared times X minus three. Well, um, for this one, it's not multiplied out. So you can't just look at it right away and say, okay, what is the leading term? You can kind of surmise it without having to multiply everything out. You could go through the whole process of multiplying it out, but that's a little bit annoying. That's all we really care is the biggest power of X. So you can kind of think about it as, well, if you were to multiply it out, what would you end up with? You'd end up with X plus two squared would be X squared plus four X plus four, and then you would have an x minus three here. And then when you multiply that out, well, your biggest power of x would come from x squared 
times x, which would be x to the third. And then we have that negative in front. So really, that's all we care about is that we'd have minus x to the third plus other terms. We don't really care about what those other terms are when we're determining the end behavior. They don't matter to us. So here we would end up with negative one, which is less than zero. So we have a negative leading coefficient and we have that number, the exponent three, which is odd. So we have negative and odd. So in this case, we end up with the left rising and the right falling. But you don't need to go through all the trouble when you see something factored out. You really just need to think about what are the biggest powers of x and what is the coefficient going to be. So you can pay attention to any numbers outside the parentheses that are going to be multiplied to everybody. And then within the parentheses, you just want to think about the, um, about the, uh, about the biggest powers of x. So um, now let's talk about the intermediate behavior, which will allow us to um, kind of get a pretty quick graph of these polynomials. So um, let's go ahead and see how to do that. So the intermediate behavior is not too hard. We just want to figure out what is happening at each of the zeros, and that will kind of give us the uh, other ingredient that we need to graph these things. So intermediate behavior. So given a polynomial in fully factored form, which means everything's kind of broken down into uh, all the factors that would correspond to the x-intercepts, um, then the multiplicity m of each zero determines the behavior of the graph near that point. So there's two possibilities. Um, the multiplicity is the power of each factor. So if m is odd, um, then what happens? Uh, the graph crosses the x-axis. And if m is even, the graph bounces off the x-axis and turns around. So these two things will help us understand. So it, it may seem a little nebulous right now because there's some weird terms and stuff like that, but it's really pretty easy. So let's, let's just go through a few examples uh, using this intermediate behavior. Sorry, I accidentally tried to mark this again. Okay, so let's do a few examples and then I'll probably make another video where I do some additional examples as well. But this will combine both elements of the uh, end behavior and the uh, intermediate behavior. So let's say graph each polynomial. So A, let's say we have 
uh, p of x, or let's say f of x, f of x equals x to the fourth times x minus two to the third times x plus one uh, squared. So similarly to the last example, if you multiplied everything out, um, and we just focused on the leading term. Well, the leading term would end up being an x to the fourth from the first factor, an x to the third from the second factor, and an x squared from the last factor. So it would be x to the fourth times, and we're only caring about the biggest one, so we only have to worry about the largest term from each. So x to the fourth times x cubed times x squared. You would add all those exponents and get x to the ninth. So that would be one, the number in front, which is positive, and nine, which is odd. So the end behavior is given by um, left falls, right rises. So that was the old stuff. The new stuff is the intermediate behavior. So the intermediate behavior is determined by the zeros. So we have the zeros, the multiplicity, and then the behavior. So the zeros are the places where it crosses the x-axis. So that is determined by looking at each of the factors. So we have the x, we have the x minus two, and we have the x plus one. So the question is, what would you plug in for x that would make each part zero? So the first thing, if you would plug zero in, x would be zero. In the middle one, if you plugged in two, you would get zero. Two minus two is zero. And in the last part, it would be negative one. Negative one plus one would also be zero. Now the multiplicity is just the exponent you see next to each factor. So next to the x, we have a four. Next to the x minus two, we have a three. And next to the x plus one, we have a, a two. So those are the multiplicities. Then that's all we care about for each of those multiplicities is are they even or are they odd? And if they're even, remember they bounce off the x-axis. If they're odd, they cross. So what is the behavior? Well, it's even, four is even, so it bounces. Three is odd, so it crosses. And two is even, so it bounces. So we get bounce, cross, and bounce. Now we can do our best to draw this graph. So if we think about drawing this graph, we have one x-intercepted zero, we have another one at two, and we have another one at negative one. Our end behavior is telling us that the left is gonna fall somehow, and the right is gonna rise. So then that's all we have to do, that's the end behavior, there's arrows, now we just need to figure out how to connect them. Well, we first go to this negative one, and it tells us to bounce off of negative one, so we come up to here, we bounce off, then zero it tells us to um, bounce off as well. And then for the two, it tells us to cross. So then we cross and connect to the other arrow. And that is pretty much a sketch of this graph. So that's how we connected up the intermediate behavior and the end behavior to draw that graph. So let's do one more example. And then like I said, I'll probably make a video with some more examples, but this is roughly the way that we do this. Again, for a lot of these, they will be factored already because in general we kind of only know how to factor things that are maybe up to degree three, um, really only degree two, but um, yeah. Let's go ahead and um, just look at one more that's completely factored. If it's not completely factored, like I said, um, it's usually gotta be pretty small or give us some kind of big hint to help us factor it. So um, let's go ahead and do another here. So let's say we have for this example, g of x, and this is, um, let's say, x plus two 
times x plus 1 squared times um, 2x minus 3. So we are completely factored. So uh, our leading term is going to be an x times an x squared times a 2x, which is 2x to the fourth. So 2 is greater than 0, which is positive, and 4 is an even number. So this tells us our end behavior. So our end behavior here, positive and even, if you go back up to the end behavior case-by-case case breakdown, this should be both sides go up. So now we just need to determine what the intermediate behavior is. So you can tell, um, so the intermediate behavior, again, we want to make that chart. So if we make that chart, um, we have uh, we have our zeros, we have um, our multiplicity of the zeros, and then we have the resulting behavior. So what are the zeros this time? Again, our three factors are the x plus 2, the x plus 1, and the 2x minus 3. So the zeros would be negative 2, negative 1, and then if you would plug in x equals 3 over 2, 3 over 2 times 2 is 3, and then 3 minus 3 is 0. So we have 3 over 2 as our last 0. Our multiplicities are 1, 2, and 1. Again, remember when the multiplicity is an odd number, it crosses, and when it's even, it bounces. So 1 is odd, so we cross. 2 is even, so we bounce. And 1 is, again, odd, so we cross. So we are cross, bounce, cross this time. And from there, we can just sketch the graph. Um, so our zeros are going to be at negative 2, negative 1, and 3 over 2, which is the same as 1.5. So negative 2, negative 1, 1 1.5. And we know both sides go up, so we should have arrows on both sides outside the farthest dot that goes up. And then we want to see how to connect. So we go through the first dot, negative 2. We cross. Then on negative 1, it tells us to bounce off. So we bounce off that one. Then we cross at 3 over 2. And we get our graph that kind of looks a little bit like a W. And that is it for sketching that graph. Uh, again, you can try to go ahead and do these things on a uh, graphing calculator or program to, uh, to confirm. Again, I recommend desmos.com. So uh, uh, you can check. that your graphs are correct. By plugging them in. I've used this before in many videos, but I just want to make a note here. Um, Desmos.com. It's basically like a free online graphing calculator for your computer. So you don't have to download anything, you just need the internet. Anyway, um, that's it for graphing polynomials. Uh, so this is Dr. Lennon signing off.